All right, thank you. So here we are, um, people, this is um, Thursday, January 28th, and this is the Senate Government Operations. We are here today. Um, our topic until I believe about 3.15 is going to be on elections. And um, what we um, have done is we've asked for people to send in their wish list of elections. And so we have gotten wish lists from the Secretary of State's office, from VPIRG, and a number of um, uh, groups that got together and submitted one list. From, I think we got some from um, a couple of the parties. I can't remember offhand. Individual um, legislators have sent us. Our committee has generated some. And <clears throat> we put them all together in a list that is posted there are a couple things a couple that are missing on there and that's I take responsibility for that because what happened is that <coughs> as people sent me their lists I would update the list but then I would update an old list and so sometimes some things got forgotten I think we now have everything either on the list or as a supplement to the list and what we're going to do, the way, the way I thought we would do this, um, because this is a huge issue, and if we're going to do anything with elections at all, it has to be done this year, because we can't, we can't monkey around with elections during an election year. So we have to have anything that we do has to be completed by crossover. And just to keep us on track, I'm aiming for a date of February 19th. I know that's a couple of weeks before we have to have it done, but if we set that as a kind of a deadline for ourselves, then um, we'll have a little slush time in there if we need it. So that's, <coughs> and the way I thought we would do this is that today we will hear from um, people who have lists and concerns and just uh, with their their suggestions for us, that would be the Secretary of State, VPER, the parties, um, the League of Women Voters, the political parties, I mean. Um, <clears throat> and and then, we'll, then what we'll do is um, the committee will go through, um, when we get the final list, the committee will go through them. And then <clears throat> there may be some that are simply beyond our control to do anything about that we can't do or that we, and we'll just cross those off or things that maybe we've already done before that but that people can agree on and we'll just do that and then we'll um, start dividing them up and I kind of divided them up and this is a little premature but I kind of divided them up into a couple different areas kind of the um, <clears throat> general the huge issue of mail out and then the general election, the primaries, the admin pieces, and then kind of miscellaneous um, changes. So with that, <coughs> um, I don't wanna start going, I wanna start hearing from committee. Do, do any of you have any questions about that so far? Um, I normally we allow only committee members to do it, but Deb, I'll make an exception this time because you don't usually come before the committee, but what was your question? Thank you, Jeanette, for that. Um, I'm just wondering, in order to set the uh, table or the stage for this here, can you tell me what's driving this conversation? This, um, every, the, the, need, the need for change. Every year, every non-election year, we look at um, making slight changes to to the elections law. Some of them come from the uh, Secretary of State's office for cleanup. Some of them come from the town clerks because there are things that they wanna do. There are some things that we learned <clears throat> in the, here, uh, like uh, maybe early processing that the town clerks have asked us to look at again for permanent changes. So <clears throat> probably every other year, I would say we, we do elections cleanup. Perfect, thank you so much. Yep. So with that, I think what we'll do is we'll start with kind of a <clears throat> setting the stage for us from the Secretary of State's office. 
and then we'll move on to other people. And <clears throat> what I would say is that don't, I know this is gonna be really hard for everybody, but don't, don't give a lot of arguments for your issues. Just tell us what your issues are and kind of a, just a very brief snapshot because we will be looking at the issues more in depth later. Does that make sense? If we get into, if we start getting into long dis, um, arguments for a particular position, we won't get through this today. So that, that's what I would like to do if, if everybody is okay with that. Committee? I can't, okay, you're the, the, these, I hate these Zoom meetings. And normally when we look at the committee, we're kind of around the table and I can see them, but I have to look all over my screen and I can only see 16 people. So if there are <clears throat> more here, I can't see them. So, <coughs> all right. But we'll so shout out and say, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of State, would you like to start? And I'm not sure how you've divided this up, but it's yours right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to be brief and I'm going to try to stay at a high level, uh, Senator White. Um, so following discussions with interested stakeholders throughout the late fall um, and, last, and the last couple of months and testimony that's already been provided to this committee, we believe there is some common ground that has been found on, on some of the items uh, related to mailing ballots to voters uh, between our office, between advocates, and between town clerks. We believe that implementation of these reforms is achievable, and we would represent a significant step forward towards uh, the vote by mail system permanently. Um, additional reforms related to mailing ballots may become practical and may make sense over time, but we, we believe that we can't, you can't jam it all into one one session, I think, uh, and and we think that this the what I'm going to highlight to you right now is is kind of a common sense approach to ballot mailing uh, following the 2020 election. Um, as many have recognized, the 2020 general election was the, one of the safest, most secure, and most accessible elections that we've ever held here in Vermont. Um, it also was one of the smoothest uh, from the standpoint of operationally. Um, having said that, we believe that ballots mailed centrally by the Secretary of State to all active voters by a certain, certain date with postage paid in both directions is is a smart a, a, a move to make. We believe that the ballots should be returned to uh, individual clerk's offices for processing, uh, just as we did this year. Um, we believe that for the August primary, because that is a completely different type of election, uh, we should continue with using uh, a, a postcard request type system. Uh, <laughs> and that we believe that it's... Uh, um, it, it would be proactive to permanently offer the option to municipalities to, uh, again, it's an option to um, mailing ballots out to their customer, to their uh, voters for local elections. Um, the second item on our list is, is the allowance for early processing during the 30 days preceding the election. This worked extremely well, as you probably are well aware, the current law says that it's one day before, um, but it, we were one of the states that had 98% of our uh, uh, locals, uh, local ballot um, uh, counts uh, in, in, in to, the, to the state by midnight on election night. Uh, and uh, we're pretty proud of that. And I, and I just came from a call with the uh, Council of State Governments. Uh, I'm a national co-chair for the Overseas Voting Initiative. Uh, and there were election directors as well as, as another, my co-director, a, a co-chair uh, uh, from Washington State. Uh, and, and they all said the same thing, that the early processing of ballots was, is really important uh, to make these elections work smoother. Um, 
Returned absentee ballots can be removed, uh, should be allowed to be removed from the certificate envelope and deposited into the tabulator or a ballot box, depending on if it's a tabulator uh, town or a uh, hand count town. Voters voting in the office may deposit directly into the ballot box or into a tabulator at that point. Uh, we believe that it's uh, the need to determine, there is a need to determine the time frame for a clerk to open mail, mailing <laughs> envelopes and examine the certificate envelope and determine whether that ballot is, is defective. And I say this because in the early processing uh, of 30 days before the election, we had some towns that used all 30 days. We had some towns that used it once a week uh, and some, down, some towns that didn't do it, uh, didn't open up the early ballots until just before the election or maybe the day before the election. Um, it's, uh, we think that there should be an opportunity to cure a defective ballot. Uh, we, we recognize that there are some issues that we have to discuss with the committee regarding the, uh, the, the primary election, but, but the general election, we had a very, very low, um, probably one of the lowest we've ever had uh, of less than one half of, of 1% uh, that ballots were considered defective. Uh, we need to clarify the reasons that a ballot is defective, but I also want to caution that Vermont is already a state that has very few reasons for a ballot to become defective. Uh, we need to consider how voters are, are provided notice of their ballot status if the ballot is, is considered defective. We currently have our my, my voter system, my voter page on our website, which um, uh, will uh, provide whether the ballot's been received and should say whether it's defective or not. Um, but we need to figure out how, you know, the, the, the real problem here is that if the town clerk doesn't open those ballots until just before the election, it may not provide an opportunity for um, uh, a ballot for a voter to, to cure a ballot that may become defective. So we think that there needs to be, whether it's once a week or something that they have to, the, the clerks have to uh, uh, do this uh, uh, to determine whether a ballot it's, it's accepted or defective. Um, we also have to be cognizant, and I, I say this with all due respect to the town clerks, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we have to be careful about the administrative burdens that we provide to them. Um, but it, it, all of these things that we've done in the past have, have allowed us to have a more final result, although it's still unofficial on election night. Um, we need to expand and codify the use of secured ballot drop boxes for return uh, and also to consider how that will be funded. Um, and we need to, for now, I would say exclude a signature matching requirement because we don't we do not have signatures on file for uh, any of our voters uh, and to start that up would be very problematic but beyond that there are many uh, folks out in the um, in the political world that will tell you that signature matching is not all it's cracked up to be. I can tell you that my signature is different today than it was 10 years ago. I can tell you that my mother's signature, she's 93 year old, uh, is, is different than it was three years ago. Um, and, and, and so I think that signature matching is something we should be looking at, but it's really something for the future, not for right away. Uh, we also think that postmark of ballots after election day um, uh, is something that it, it's, a, it's not a solution that we need in, in Vermont. Uh, we have very few um, uh, post, uh, ballots that, uh, that come back to us after the election. Um, and, and if we did decide the postmark uh, of, of ballots, uh, the postmark of, of, uh, of election day is something that we wanna look at then we have a lot of other dates that we have to move out. For instance, and I'll just give you a few, uh, the, the town clerks have 48 hours to get their certification of the results that they have to our office uh, after the election. So if, if we accepted postmark ballots 
uh, up to three days after, we'd have to change that because uh, the, the, the Friday, they, they've already reported their results to us by Friday morning. Uh, so we need, we would have to move that date. Then we have a, a, um, uh, a finalization, a, a canvas date that is seven days after the election, that would have to be moved out. Then we have to look at all the, the recount statutes as to when recounts can be uh, 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 set up uh, or requested. Uh, so all these things have to be looked at and it all has to be in conjunction, especially with, with a presidential election, keeping an eye on December 14th or roughly uh, for the uh, 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 electoral college. Uh, so, and in the interest of time, I'm going to I'm going to go back. I'll let Chris or Will uh, add uh, anything that they might want to add at this point. We have looked at the list that came from uh, uh, your office, uh, uh, Senator White, um, and we would certainly have uh, more comments on all the things that are listed on there. Some are some we would oppose, some we would support, uh, some we don't know what it's requesting. So uh, there's a lot there and uh, we would certainly defer to uh, having to further discussions with the committee about those items on that list. But I wanted to give you the uh, a, a synopsis of, of what we have had discussions with some of the advocates and, and the town clerks. Um, and and uh, um, these are things that we think are, are doable uh, for, the, for the immediate future. With that, I'll turn it back to you for uh, Chris or Will to uh, decide if they want to speak as well. Th thanks. <clears throat> and I will say that um, I would prefer, actually, if you don't comment on what um, the other things that were sent in at this point, because we'll be taking them up um, <clears throat> and we'll be looking at those in a more organized manner by topic. So at this point, um, I don't. I don't want to say I don't care if you support them or not, but at this point, we really don't. <clears throat> we will. We will later on. So, Will, did you have, or Chris, did you have anything to add here? I don't have anything further, Madam Chair. I think the secretary hit the high points, and we're interested to hear what what other folks have to say. Um, will might have something. Thanks, Will. No, I, th I think um, Secretary Kondo said it well, and I know you've got a lot of people who need time today. Yeah, so I think that that's <clears throat> exactly the way we're gonna do it is people will just present their ideas and then, but not necessarily comment on anybody else's ideas that are there because we, that is testimony that we'll begin to take later. So with that, um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Secretary Condos and, and I, I will take this one other opportunity. We do it whenever we can to, to thank the elections division. Um, I know that Will is looking a lot less haggard than he did a while ago and um, <laughs> for running a really good election and, and it went smoothly. And I think that that was due to the, um, incredible work done by the Secretary of State's Elections Division and the town clerks. So we we all owe you a, a thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Senator White. So with that, do we want to go to, um, I think we had Paul Burns on the list and I think you're representing a number of <clears throat> groups. Um, yes, unless Carol Dawes is ready to I think she was ahead of me. Um, oh, I don't have yeah. a, a copy of the um, <clears throat> list here, but if you want to defer to Carol, that's just fine with me. Carol, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you, Paul. Okay. And thank sure. you, thank Senator, you. For, uh, um, for, a, for thanking us as clerks for um, the elections. We couldn't have done it without the collaboration with the Secretary of State's office, with the legislature, with the post office. There were a lot of parties that participated. Um, so you have my memo. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. going to go through the memo uh, in 
uh, in detail. I'm also not going to repeat things that the secretary has already said. Um, just a couple things that, that I would point out that, that we would like to, um, to also have considered uh, is whatever authority might be necessary for uh, towns to hold outdoor elections. Um, Drive-through voting, uh, that certainly worked well for us um, in August and November. And so making sure that we had that um, option um, would be uh, important. Um, we have in the, uh, several times in the past talked about perhaps changing the way write-in uh, votes are tallied, uh, allowing uh, an opportunity for candidates to uh, declare their write-in candidacy, uh, either through the Secretary of State's office or directly to a clerk um, on election day so that we're not having to tally um, ballots, uh, votes that aren't for legitimate candidates. Um, the other thing is uh, we would love to see a, a review, a complete review of how the August primaries are done. Um, they are uh, expensive, they are time consuming, they are confusing. Um, and I think that, uh, that the, the voters would appreciate some um, some review of, of that process. Um, but the one key that I wanted to say, uh, what really made this past fall uh, successful was flexibility. Um, by not mandating um, and restricting options, by allowing there to be different options uh, that communities could, uh, could use, um, whatever was best for their particular community and their situation. And so I think making sure that we maintain that flexibility is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. That's the shortest list I think I've ever heard from the town clerks around elections. <laughs> It's four pages written, so. I know, I know. <laughs> and I think most of them are, are on the list. Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, any questions for Carol committee? I'm looking at, okay, Paul? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the Executive Director of VPIRG, the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Um, so th thanks to Carol and the rest of the clerks as well. Uh, I can't say that enough for uh, making the 2020 election as successful as it was, uh, thanks to, to the Secretary of State and his staff um, and all who played a significant role in that. I uh, submitted a couple of sets of recommendations. The first that I wanna comment on was actually filed jointly, Madam Chair, as you mentioned, and uh, VPIRG um, uh, uh, submitted it, but on behalf of our organization, and I'll just list the other nine or 10, uh, AARP Vermont, ACLU of Vermont, Conservation Law Foundation, Disability Rights Vermont, the League of Women Voters of Vermont, uh, Rights and Democracy, Vermont Conservation Voters, Vermont NEA, and uh, Main Street Alliance of Vermont as well uh, got on after I submitted that. So uh, let me run through what these recommendations are briefly. These all have to do with um, the idea of making uh, universally mailed ballots a permanent feature of our general elections moving forward. So five items uh, that we think are most important or, or really significant uh, priorities on this particular issue. The first is uh, ballots automatically mailed to every active registered voter, just as we saw it was done in uh, November. Number two is multiple return options, the drop boxes, polling places, election offices, etc. Number three is the importance of preserving uh, prepaid uh, return uh, postage envelopes as was done. The pre-canvassing the Secretary of State, uh, Condos spoke about earlier, very, very important. Um, and indeed, I, I guess I would add that as a part of that, we, we may wanna look more at um, some requirement about when ballots uh, come in uh, that, they, that they must be pre-canvassed or uh, that some action must be taken in part to potentially determine whether there are errors or problems with those ballots that could potentially be cured. So, and that gets to the fifth item, which is to add, this is the only one that would really be added to the uh, process that was in place for the November elections, uh, some sort of a curing process so that voters 
who do the right thing, submit their ballots, intending them for, for them to be counted, obviously. Um, but but perhaps a number of them have an error that could easily be fixed or cured, like failing to sign that inner envelope uh, to give them every opportunity to um, to correct that error so that their ballot could be counted. Many states are doing that now. There are different ways of getting there. We won't. I, don't, I know you don't want to get into the uh, specifics of that now, but adding a curing process is important. And again, that may how you go about that may necessitate some change to the pre-canvassing uh, piece as well. Uh, so those are the pieces that we think are most important for 2021 consideration so that we can be squared away for the 2022 election season. But additional items um, that we wanted to uh, note was uh, the question of uh, whether we can count ballots that are postmarked by election day and received sometime after election day. We support uh, looking uh, closely at what we could do on that. Um, Secretary of State said that there are very few of these ballots that, that come in after election day. I think that's true. And I expect that that will continue to be the case as long as we have robust public education programs to try to encourage people to send those ballots in uh, on time and, and well before the election. And my organization and many others uh, who endorse these proposals played a part in helping to educate folks. But there still are uh, some that come in after. Um, and in fact, we don't know exactly how many because there is no record kept, uh, no requirement of the clerks currently that they keep a record of how many ballots come in after. So, so it's an area that, uh, that we think is worthy of consideration moving forward. Um, there's a, <clears throat> another item where some states have uh, moved to uh, uh, eliminate the requirement that for of the inner certificate envelope requirement, I guess I should say. There's more information and recommendations that we made on that, but I think it's one more way that we could avoid any um, unintended disenfranchisement of voters. An important one that could and should, I think, be addressed this year is to provide greater access for people with disabilities who may receive their ballots uh, currently electronically uh, but, but we could perhaps do more to allow them uh, and could do more to allow them to complete, fill out those ballots and return them electronically. And I will just say, I'm not the expert on this, but I, Secretary of State's office has expressed great willingness to, um, to work with um, our colleagues and allies on this, particularly at Disability Rights Vermont. And so I expect that we will find common ground on a, on a reasonable path forward here, but, but it's worth noting, I think, as well. And then last would kind of reference is the, the point that I was just making about collecting more data, um, like how many ballots come in after election day is something that we may want to look at. Uh, and we would uh, add that uh, there, there might, it might make sense as part of this legislation to um, invite or require some sort of a report or analysis after the 2022 election so that as Secretary Kondo said, you know, that maybe we get into some of these issues after 2022, uh, but something that would help to tee up what those next steps might be. We still recognize that 2021 is a, you have limited bandwidth to do some of these things. Most important is to make it permanent and, and ideally add a curing mechanism, but we can do some of these other things perhaps later out and, and some sort of review or consideration of that we think might make sense. And, um, and all of our organizations recognize that the Secretary of State has made a reasonable argument for additional resources. His election staff is small, incredibly competent, and incredibly hardworking, and, and there should be more of them. Um, and I, I just think that he's made a very, very strong case, and all of us agree with that as well. That may be somewhat beyond the purview of this committee, but, uh, but worth noting. And then, so that's it for the... Um, uh, universally mailed ballot recommendations. I will just name quickly just a couple of other priorities that are VPIRG recommendations specifically. Uh, one is ranked choice voting. I'll note that ranked choice voting is gonna be on the ballot in uh, Burlington on town meeting day. If that is approved by voters there, we will urge you and your colleagues to support that um, change to their charter. And then ultimately we're looking at a potential change uh, in the way that we elect our federal uh, uh, office holders here for US Senate and Congress um, uh, and president even uh, where some states like Maine for instance have used ranked choice voting in those elections. Um, four or five other states used it in presidential primaries in 2020. So that doesn't necessarily have to be a 20, 
21 issue, but worth noting here. And then finally, um, in the way that we run our state races, uh, we have supported for the last couple of sessions, a ban on corporate contributions to candidates. This committee has passed that three times. The Senate has passed it three times. We hope the fourth time is a charm uh, and that this year we can get the House to take it up. The House Government Operations Committee did pass it last year, but it never made it to the floor after COVID struck. So banning corporate contributions, and we think the flip side, and, and by the way, that was S-47 last year, um, and S-32 was a bill to um, simply study ways to better, uh, to make our our uh, public uh, financing system work better. Looking, for instance, at democracy dollars is one example that has worked well in Seattle. Um, and we have a system that just isn't, isn't being utilized, isn't working right now. And if we ban corporate contributions, the flip side of that coin might be, how can we make public financing work better? And so that was a, a, an additional recommendation. We might say, why not pair those two concepts into one bill? That those were our recommendations. We certainly would be interested in weighing in on other items as you take them up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Any questions for uh, Senator Rahm? Yeah, um, thank you, Paul, for all of that. I really i am doing a lot of soul searching about how to make public finance of, of campaigns better. Um, you know, I don't feel like the conversation has evolved too much past vouchers for people to support local candidates in um, more municipal races. Have you seen any best practices around changing and simplifying uh, public financing of campaigns in other states? If I, if I can interrupt there, I don't think we want to get into the details of okay. any of the issues right now. Okay. I mean, we will take, that is definitely on our list and we've passed it before and it will remain on the list. And so I, unless you um, have a burning Maybe you desire- send that. <laughs> I would be happy to follow up, Senator Rom. Well, yes. we will we will take it up also. So um, yeah. when we get into the details of this, but I don't I don't really want us to get into the details right now until we've heard from all the all the um, people who have um, wish lists. Mm -hmm. So I see AAR. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank I you. see AARP is here. Did you want to? Um, are you here for support or did you have something to add? Uh, thank you, Senator. We have a few things to add. Um, for the record, my name is Greg Marshall and I'm state director with AARP Vermont. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. First, like others, I wanna congratulate uh, and thank the Secretary of State, the small election staff and all of the town clerks and election volunteers who were able to adjust quickly to the pandemic restrictions and deliver an election excuse me, in Vermont that by all standards was a great success. ARP strongly supports maintaining the election changes that were implemented for the 2020 primary and general election as a result of the pandemic. So automatically mailing ballots to all registered voters and allowing them to either vote from home or by mail or to drop their ballot at a town clerk or place in a secure election, an election drop box. All of these changes made voting in Vermont easier, more accessible and increased voter turnout. Many of our members, so people 65 and over vote more than any other age group. ARP's members in Vermont who voted from home by mail did so safely and securely and voter turnout across the state increased as a result. The comments that we have received uh, from our members across the state have indicated that this was not just during a, the pandemic, which was they were grateful for, but they would love this opportunity to be able to continue to do that moving forward. The pandemic definitely has shown us that a truly inclusive democracy requires us to change our whole way of thinking about society. And to do so, we have to broaden our mindset and reevaluate who was left out and why. We have the ability to greatly expand opportunities for Vermonters to participate in government by maintaining changes, both digital and non-digital, that have been made to provide more access during the pandemic. So maintaining these options for Vermonters to vote is a top priority for AARP. Again, ARP supports the Secretary of State's request for funding and a staff position to support voting by mail. The Secretary of State needs uh, time and resources um, to implement and maintain voting by mail. We support ballots being mailed automatically with prepaid postage, maintaining multiple options for more mail ballots to be returned, including drop boxes, and allowing ballots to be processed by election officials well in advance of election day. 
We believe that people with disabilities should have full and independent access to the democratic process and support efforts to assure this is a true, uh, that this is true for all of our elections. And I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, thank you. And I, I appreciate that everybody um, is supporting the Secretary of State's, um, for the first I should say that we appreciate what VPIRG and AARP and the parties and all the other advocacy groups did around the election to help educate people. I think it was, um, it, they were an important part of the success. But I, in terms of the uh, getting somebody else to help, I don't know where we would ever find somebody as devoted and well qualified. So just remember, we might, that was supposed to be a compliment to the, and I did see Will grin a little bit there, but so. Um, uh, we have, Lila, did the league have anything that they would like to add to this? You are, okay. I'm sorry, I was uh, not expecting to be up quite so soon. Uh, Lila Richardson, um, I'm testifying on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. Um, as Paul Burns uh, indicated, uh, we were one of the organizations that signed on to the recommendations that he submitted uh, to the committee. I would just like to note that when I was looking on the uh, website prior to this meeting, I did not see those comments posted. So I'm not sure what happened there, but I, th <clears throat> I th think, um, for the public, it would be important. I assume the committee does have the letter that um, <clears throat> Paul was referring to. Um, and uh, I just wanna quickly say that if I have problems with my internet, it's because I have a very, very poor connect internet connection at my home. So I'm hoping that even with the video up, um, I'll be able to go through this quickly. Uh, just a few points uh, to emphasize from the League's point of view. Um, <clears throat> the League is a nonpartisan political organization that um, it really promotes informed and active participation in government. And it is very heavily involved in voter education and advocacy. Uh, and I just want to stress nonpartisan because um, we think that all of the issues that we're uh, suggesting that the committee take up will um, benefit all Vermonters, uh, no matter what their political affiliation is. Uh, so it's important for everyone to participate, everyone to be educated, to understand um, how the election system works. Um, and very quickly, I would add to everyone else who has complimented the Secretary of State's office and the town clerk uh, throughout the state, um, there was an extremely difficult situation that they were dealing with, a very aggressive, difficult timeline. Uh, the league worked very closely on education issues with the Secretary of State's office, and uh, they were incredibly responsive and helpful uh, to making sure that voters got all the education about the new system and how it was going to work. Um, and uh, one thing that the league worked on that, that um, hasn't been mentioned uh, before is voter registration. We don't really see any issues that have to be changed for that, but there are a few things um, that everyone will have to pay attention to if we start looking at how the universal mail system works. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just to go over the points that, that uh, Paul mentioned, uh, we support the idea of all voters being sent the general election ballot. Um, I think that for the primary, um, there should be discussion about how that process would work. And if the postcards that were sent uh, this past election cycle were a good idea, um, saying that all voters will get the uh, the ballots is not totally 
realistic or true, there still has to be a sort of backup process for people who have moved, people who register after the central mailing occurs. And I think that was confusing for people um, in this past cycle to see how the existing early absentee voter process worked in conjunction with the mailing. So I think you know, it's important to take a good look at that so that new voters uh, understand what their options are um, and how, how they can get uh, ballots to mail in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we also support the multiple return uh, options for the ballots that are sent out. Uh, we think it's extremely important to have the prepaid postage. Um, it's also uh, very important to uh, have the pre-canvassing uh, that uh, several people have already discussed. And uh, that ties into one of the, the really uh, important issues for the league, which is uh, the opportunity to cure the defective ballots. Um, and I think everybody recognizes that the two have to be considered uh, together and that pre-canvassing is also important just uh, in terms of making the system work, making the system work for the town clerks, um, for everybody involved. Um, and uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, access for people with disabilities is an issue that should definitely be looked at. Um, we would also um, encourage the committee to talk to Disability Rights Vermont about that. Um, I understand that there are issues around possible uh, electronic uh, return of ballots that are sent to the military overseas. Um, and so that would be a part of looking at, to, at a system of how, how to uh, have voting electronically. And uh, <clears throat> finally, we do think that for uh, things that the committee doesn't decide to do, the legislature doesn't decide to do this year, it would be extremely important to collect and study data to s determine uh, what is going on in Vermont now with respect to issues like the uh, receipt of ballots after the election date, how prevalent that is and how that might be changed. Um, would be very important to us. So knowing the committee <coughs> doesn't want to hear arguments um, on the, these issues, those are really our, our main uh, considerations that we think that the committee should be looking at this year. Thank you, Lila. It isn't that we don't want to hear the arguments. It's that no. we want to get a complete list first so that we can um, look at them together and um, so that we're not having um, ar arguments for and against things in kind of a hodgepodge way, but that we can take them in a coordinated way. So I appreciate I that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to suggest you would not listen to the, uh, to the we, various arguments and to the various possible solutions as well. We, we do try to listen, but some yes. <laughs> people think we often don't well enough, but so I see we also invited um, the political parties and I see we have somebody here from the Republican party, the Democratic party. Is there someone here representing the progressive party? I don't, I don't think so unless I don't know who. So with that, um, should we go to the Republican party first? And I don't know Deb or Pat how you're how you want to do it. And remember, we're, we're giving our list of, we, our wish list here, rather than commenting on things that are already um, proposed. So take it away, the two of you. Well, if I could, Madam Chair, I'm here actually as president of Campaign for Vermont. So oh, I you will, are. Oh, yeah, good. So I will turn it over to Deb. Because I had not heard from Campaign for Vermont, but I sent a thing out. Um, yes, good. Oh, I'm happy to hear. We, okay. we, sent, we sent written comments and I'm here just to listen and to add anything that, uh, that uh, I could. Oh, great, 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 that's great. So let's go to Deb and then um, Bruce Olson and then back to you, Pat, for Campaign for Vermont, is that okay? Okay, yep. great. Okay, Deb. All right, 
Thank you, Senator White. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very important discussion. Um, this is more of an educational moment for me than anything else. I did um, send in a list of items that uh, the Vermont Republican Party might be interested. It did not make the window of opportunity to get added to your list today, but Gail does have a copy of this. And I believe I sent it to um, one of our senators as well. And it will be added. Okay, thank, we'll thank you for that. So with, with that being said, I'm not gonna go through my list. It's 15 items or more. So, and we're already into this meeting 45 minutes. So I'm gonna try to keep my time sh very short here. Um, this is a very interesting conversation. I, I, think, I think every one of us wants to make sure that we have the maximum voter integrity that we can embed in our election process. I do believe that um, the November election in Vermont went off very well due to the dedication of Vermonters and all the people involved. So I, I, I think we can, you know, that's something we can all be proud of. Um, and I do support any modifications to the process uh, provided that they continue to as I said, increase the integrity of the voting system in the state of Vermont. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess I apologize that I didn't get the list in time to um, it, it get it on, fault. but I will I will get it and I will add it to this ever growing list. Brian, Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Deb Billiger's list is on our website right now. Okay, but you, you know, my, my little way of making lists and categories is um, a little <laughs> antiquated here, but so I will, I will definitely look at that. Thank you, Senator Palomar. Thank you. Um, Bruce? Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for this opportunity to participate in initial discussions about possible uh, election law changes. Uh, my name is Bruce Olson. I'm chair of the Vermont Democratic Party. And I first want to echo the comments of earlier speakers about the remarkable work that uh, Secretary Condos, his staff, and the town clerks did in terms of implementing a vote by mail for the first time during a pandemic this past year. Uh, we think they did a remarkable job under very trying circumstances. And uh, there may be some tweaks that we need to make to this system, but they did a, a phenomenal job and the first time is never easy and our hats go off to them. I'm gonna be fairly brief. Uh, we've just submitted uh, a few things that we think are important in terms of our priorities. We can go into late, uh, more detail at a later time, but first and foremost is the continuation of uh, universal vote by mail. And we add the option of making sure that Vermonters can also vote on election day uh, in their town offices. We know that many Vermonters like that idea, they like the um, kind of the ritual of going to the voting booth and, and participating on election day. We don't wanna see that end, but we support a universal vote by mail primarily because it had such a significant increase in voter turnout and that results in our view in a more sound uh, democracy. Um, so that is really the intent of having uh, you know, that type of system. We did it because there, there was a pandemic this year but I know where I live, when I woke up on election day, there's a half a foot of snow on the ground. And for many Vermonters, that can be an impediment when they have to get kids off to school, go to work. They may be infirmed in some way, you know, that, uh, and that's always a difficult challenge to get out and vote. And so we think that if they have that opportunity to do it ahead of time, that's a good thing uh, for, all, for everybody and uh, for our democracy. We also know that the Secretary of State's office took on this challenge, but they, we have to think about whether they need additional staff, whether they need technological upgrades in their systems. We know this is a problem throughout the Vermont government in terms of the Department of Labor. We see that with unemployment compensation, with the motor vehicle system. You know, it's a very tenuous and kind of old system that the state is working with. And in order to have not only a safe election, but a secure election that all Vermonters feel confident in, we think that we have to make sure that there's sufficient funding to maintain uh, an up-to-date technological system, particularly if we want at some point to expand any type of electronic voting system. Uh, we would reserve comment on that because we don't know enough about us to what that would look like at this time. 
but um, we know that it was used for overseas and for uh, military balloting. But if we were to expand it domestically, we would like to see more details of that before we uh, have any comments. We certainly support a curing process. We got complaints from voters who said, I voted all my life. I'm a registered voter. I made one mistake in submitting my ballot and now my ballot is not gonna count. And you know, to us, that's, that's a, I don't wanna say it's a crime, but it's, it's something that should not be allowed to happen, that somebody who makes an honest mistake should be able to go back, correct their ballot, and make sure that their voice is heard in our democratic process. The last thing I wanna comment on is that we've seen many times where candidates vote in a primary, uh, excuse me, they run in a primary in one party, and then when it comes to the general election, they change the, their primary part, their, what we call the principal party affiliation. And uh, we've got complaints uh, from Democrats, from non-Democrats that say, well, they don't understand that. Why is it that somebody says they're, uh, say, party A in the primary, but when it becomes a general election, they're party B? And, you know, it's almost like a kind of a truth and advertising issue. If you are going to be in one party in the primary, that should be your principal party in the general election. Now, we're not saying that you cannot have another endorsement from another political party in the general election, but if you're in party A in the primary, you should be party A as your principal uh, ballot line in the general election and with a slash for party B if you're co-endorsed by another uh, party. Uh, that's quickly kind of over you some of our main concerns. We will certainly be ready to testify and give additional information concerning uh, in our views concerning uh, more technical aspects of vote by mail and, and other issues at a later time. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Thank you. Any questions, committee members? Thank you, Bruce. Okay, I think we'll go to Pat for Campaign for Vermont. And I'm very happy because I had not seen your, your um, response. You are muted. People have been trying to do that to you for a long time. I know now. exactly. Silence me. Forget it. Yeah. But, but anyway, thank you, Senator, for including us. We sent you a note uh, that we would participate, and I just sent the uh, our list uh, today, so it was my fault. Um, but I wanted to add kudos. Um, oh, for the record, I'm the president of Campaign for Vermont, and we wanted to add uh, kudos to the Secretary of State and to the um, uh, town clerks. They, it's just an amazing process. Um, the only thing I heard that um, uh, we have on our list that no one else has has uh, talked about is the voter checklist itself. Um, we know we've been very overly conservative, I think, with that list forever. And I think we should take a look at it uh, to see if there's a way that it is not quite so inflated, since, particularly since we have same day registration. If we make a mistake, it's easy enough to put somebody back on the list. Um, and I think that... Um, There'll be a lot of money saved, a lot of time and effort uh, saved um, to take a look at that list. Other than that, I agree with everything we've heard today, and um, we look forward to seeing the list and, and adding our comments, and I appreciate your including us, Senator. Thanks. Thank you. And I will get uh, those three um, missing lists together with all the others, and um, so thank you. So what I would like to do now, committee, I believe, unless anybody has any specific questions for anybody, I'd like to try to help get us in a committee discussion to organize our next steps on this, because this is a huge undertaking. And if we're going to do anything, we have to, we have to be um, organized and efficient about it. So what, what I have done up to this point is I've made um, I, I made those categories before, but now I've made um, six different categories um, that, and here, here's the categories that I made now in terms of going forward. Are there any that, any of these suggestions that we can just automatically eliminate? Are there any that we agree on and that maybe we've passed before and can just agree on or that would take very little conversation. Then um, I think that the biggest issue here before us is, and the most philosophical change is the uh, continuing the automatic mail out 
to all voters. So that's another category. Then there are, there's a category that um, are there areas, there are things that would apply to mail in votes, whether they're automatic or just by request, such as the elimination of the inner envelope, the expansion for electronic returns, multiple um, return options, use of drop boxes, the postmark and early processing. Those are issues that whether we went with automatic mail out to everybody or not are issues that we should look at because they will affect um, mail in votes um, regardless of whether they're, it's automatic to everybody. Then there's a category of kind of administrative changes that will affect town clerks particularly, I think. The issue of nicknames on ballots, curing of ballots, the signature verification, um, the counting of write-ins, the defective, clarifying defective ballots and consistent polling hours across the state. Then there's a category that's administrative, but it's a little broader than just that um, kind of beyond maybe the town clerks. And that's uh, the suggestion to have only one checklist and not, not to have a checklist um, but in each town, translation services and the collection of data. Then there's kind of these uh, some mis very miscellaneous ones and that's um, the town clerk's independence from the select board the review of major party requirements and the faithless electoral issue. And I have no idea what that even means. It came in from somebody and I think it's for the electoral college, but I have no idea what, what that is. So um, those are uh, those are some of the, the, the way I tried to break down the issues. Does that make any sense to committee members at all? Sure. So, yes, I, I think it's like one of those surveys you take. With. If yes, here you go to down here. If no, you go someplace else. I think it, 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 it's good, actually. It's great. Because if we decide not to do one thing, it means there's a whole lot of things that we don't have to discuss. But yeah, go ahead, Senator Rahm. I'm fine. I think Jim, uh, Secretary Condos had his hand up, but I'm okay. Well, I'm asking committee members first. Oh, so I mean, generally, I, I would agree. I think that's um, a good approach. I have heard a lot about the faithless elector piece as a member of the Electoral College this year. Um, I don't think there's any particular changes we need to make there. There was a Supreme Court case around it, but I, I think if the committee's interested, it's an interesting conversation about the way that the electoral college isn't very standard across the states. Electors have very different rules they fall under in each state, but it's more filled. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have time to, to go there. So, Senator Polina? I think what you outlined is good. It's a lot, which is not, not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a lot to wade through. I hope that we can come up with ones that we think we can move forward together on because there's general agreement on that would help us feel like you build some momentum and get going on it. I was just going back to Senator Rahm, I mean, about the Electoral College. I mean, we did pass national popular vote in the state yeah. of Vermont. So that, that relates to that a little bit. Anyway, we've made it clear that we'd rather see national popular vote. Right. So, oh, okay, Senator Condos, I mean, Secretary Condos, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, just remind the committee that everything that may be proposed may have a price tag to it. And that is something that has to be considered because remember that for the most part, uh, we only receive 450, roughly $450,000 in election cycle for uh, ballot printing. And that is based off the HAVA 2002 uh, when the money came out in 2004 or six, um, we, we were not able to assume the cost of stuff we were already doing. So that is the 
previous set of ballots that we, we get going forward, like this past election, we had specific uh, federal money that came to us to allow us to do what we did. We don't have enough money to do this, even, even in the future. I, I, I would agree, but as we go through the issues, that'll be one of the questions that gets asked is, can it be done within our current budget standards? And I, I mean, that is going to have to be asked for many of these, not just, Will, did you have a comment? Very quickly, Senator White. Um, I would just encourage, I just want to point out, obviously this, the reforms we're talking about are very important to me and are going to have a huge effect on how elections run. I wanted to point out that I think that um, there are a number of the critically important and kind of central items that are common across a lot of these lists that we support, that the coalition of advocates support and that the clerk support. And I just hope that the mm -hmm. committee um, will pay attention to the items that seem to be supported by almost everybody in this room right now, testifying to the committee. I think at some point it would be helpful to show what items are common across these lists and agreed to by all of the interested parties. Um, I guess we could somehow do that, I thought that that would probably become obvious when we took testimony on different issues. Um, but so if, are there any on this, on the list that we currently have, and I haven't seen the list from the two parties or campaign for Vermont, but are there any on the list that we currently had that we can eliminate? And I can think of one right offhand. The 16 year old vote that would take a constitutional amendment. We can't do constitutional amendments this year. Right, right. So can we cross that one off? Yes. Committee? Yes. Sure. yes. All right, yeah. so gone. Okay. The, um, Keisha, Senator Rahm, you seem to indicate that there really wasn't anything around the faithless electoral issue. That uh, someone else could speak up, but uh, Will, I'll let Will speak up. I mean, I think okay. I don't know who brought that up or, or what they wanted to change. Just very quickly, I, th I think it's a, it's a fine subject to consider. Um, I want to make sure the committee is aware we have language in the law. Number one, the national popular vote you adopted a while ago but also within the presidential election statute where it talks about the electors and the decisions they make. It's actually the very last sentence in the subchapter about presidential elections says that the electors shall vote for the candidates that received the majority of the votes for the party of the candidates that received the majority of the votes in the election. So we have that language that is meant to, that's meant to address the faithless elector issue where it says you're tied, you're voting, you can't go rogue and vote against what the people in Vermont voted for. It's my understanding that um, those provisions are on the books in some number of states and there's question about whether they're constitutional or not. Well, I don't, if we have it on our, our statutes and it, we're not gonna determine whether it's constitutional or not. So I would say we take that one off the list unless anybody wants to keep it on. I would not advocate for making changes. And I think what other states have done after the Supreme Court decision in July is they said that you can legally, and you can all can correct me if I'm wrong, you can legally charge penalties on somebody for going against the okay. their role in the Electoral College. I, I No one put me under sort of pain of perjury and, and, you know, financial risk to do it. I think it was a fair process that asked me to commit to being a faithful elector. And I don't think we need to add anything to that section. Okay. I've just crossed it off my list. Committee? I'm all for taking it off. Sure. Okay. I should say we also have three or four bills in our committee now that deal with elections. And my and I will make sure that anything that's in those bills gets on the list. I think right now everything that's in those bills is also on the list, but I'll make sure that that happens. So are there any issues on which we agree that we can maybe just take off the conversation table and 
do. And oh, first, before I made a note to myself here that we were all busy thanking people. And I heard Will give a thank you the other day that was a really heartfelt thank you that I hadn't heard anybody give before. And that was to the Postal Service. And I just wanted to acknowledge their role in Vermont. And in some states, it, they might not have been very cooperative, but my understanding is that in Vermont they were. So shout out to them. So are there any, does anybody want to revisit or do we just want to repass the corporate contribution that we passed before? And I will remind us that it does not, it is not a ban on corporate contributions. It isn't written that way. What it is, is it says that only individuals can um, contribute to candidates and their campaigns. That's all it says. Committee? Brian, Senator Colomore? Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I voted for that last time, even though- I don't remember if you did or not. I, I, I'm pretty sure you didn't. And I would not vote again. Okay, so we'll leave that on the list for now then. <clears throat> is there anybody that um, okay. is, we have for a number of years asked for some, some kind of a study on public financing? Should we again ask for that? We can figure out the wording later, but. Yes, I wish. I think it's. Okay. Yes. Okay. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator Rom. Uh, Senator Polina first. Is that? He, he just uh, said yes. I was just saying yes. Oh, I, my clarifying question is: they have not given us that study, or it never passed. The study never made it out. Why, ha why have we not gotten that study before? Is it, I, it passed. I think um, it was S thirty two, and it never passed through the House. Okay. Yes, I would support that kind of stuff. Allison. I wish we actually had time to deal with it this session and not have to do a study, but given where we are and the amount on our plate with the continuing yeah. pandemic, I would say a study was where we ended up. Senator Colomar. Well, in deference to the Secretary of State's concerns about cost, I don't assume that this is gonna be a free study. Um, Senator Polina. I, I would just, say that I don't think it's necessarily a very large study either. It's more like a report. Going back to what yeah. Senator Rahm mentioned before, she asked if other states had done something similar. And we know that Maine has done it and Connecticut has done it. And I think um, New Mexico or Arizona has done it. So it's really a question of having somebody issue, talk to those folks and issue a report to us as to how other states have accomplished it. I don't think it's a huge study is all I'm saying. Okay, we'll leave that on there and then we'll find out what it is. Um, so I, there is one, um, one on the list that I found troubling and I will just throw it out here and see what, where other people are. It was um, a requirement that in order to be a candidate for office, you had to have voted in every um, state or general election for which you were eligible for the four years you would be claiming residency right and i i i have an issue with that because i think voting we don't require voting and i would find it um hard to require that for candidates but i leave that up to the committee about whether you want to have more conversation about that or not senator clarkson but at least that's an issue that's actually not on our list requiring uh, voting. It's one issue that no one raised. It's only this issue uh, with the candidate. Um, so I, uh, I agree that it's troubling because we all know that favorite bumper sticker of ours that I will restrain myself from sharing verbally in this committee, but things happen and things happen uh, inexplicably. And I think if we, it's, it is, as much as I would like to uh, ensure that every candidate voted, uh, particularly uh, in the last four years of a candidacy, it, it's hard to require it if we don't also require voting, period. I wish we sort of did require voting, but um, 
It didn't even make it on our list requiring voting. Yes, it is on the list. No, it's only for candidates. For, for candidates. Yeah. Right, it's but that's not candidates. requiring voting for all Vermonters. No, it is a require that what's on the list is what I brought up. It is a requirement right. to run for office, to be a candidate. You have to have voted in the state and general elections. Senator Collimore? Well, I was going to ask a, that question. I, I didn't understand what you were... I didn't understand the question, I guess. If you're going to be a candidate for any candidate for any office in Vermont? I, I guess, and if you... And my concern is, why wouldn't we also require them to vote in local elections? Well, or that's school my board question. Because those are, those are equally as important as state elections. That was the thrust of my question. I, if, if running for the board of aldermen or city council or the school board, that you have to have voted for that in the past, to me, that's a little different than a statewide office. Uh, I see a distinction there, and I'm not sure that... I even understand what's trying to be proposed. Senator Ron, would you like to enlighten sure. us? Yeah, I mean, so I had read Senator White, the chairwoman's sort of summary in, in, in an unintended summary in um, the, uh, was it the Times Argus? I can't remember. And, um, you know, it was sort of a rundown of the committee having looked at a residency requirement before in, with some definition and coming up, sh without that it sounded like there is no there is no actual definition of residency for the purposes of either the two years you're supposed to be a resident in your area for running for uh house and senate or the four years for statewide office and so you know i at some point just felt like the one thing i would think we would hope all candidates would do in the two or four years before they run for office is vote in those elections well, there's a distinction about being a resident and about voting, right? Yeah. Yes, but but we don't we don't have a definition of resident because it sounds like you didn't define it based on tax liability oh, or we, we no. permanent residence somewhere. We we did not define it. It right. the, there are many definitions of resident for different purposes, and and um, it. We, we could stab at a definition. I think it's I futile. Think in generally, it feels like it should either be defined or, or not required, but I don't, we don't have a definition of what residency is. Well, it is required because it's in the constitution. Right. So it is required and we can't change that. We could come up with a definition, but we took, we took hours and hours and hours of testimony. And the only, the best thing we could come up with was that if there was a challenge, it would be the courts that would decide. Because if somebody is away at the Peace Corps for three years, does that disqualify them? Um, no, if they're in the ser military service or Doctors Without Borders, it doesn't disqualify them. If they leave for 10 months to go take care of their ailing mother right. in another state, it does. So it, it is very complicated. But I, I do have, I mean, the committee can decide you want to put this requirement in, but I have a very serious issue about requiring people to vote in order to run as a candidate. I mean, I think it's the one so, thing you could do if you were anywhere else in the, you, you, if you called Vermont your mental home, you could still vote there while being in Washington. You could, abroad. you could, but should it be required? That's Allison. So in lieu, of a residency definition in the election statutes. Uh, it is a proxy actually showing interest in, in Vermont and in our elections. It Voting is actually a proxy for that engagement. And I, I have some sympathy for voting as a prerequisite for being a candidate, if particularly if you're living abroad. So. You know, I, I would hope that every candidate for every office up and down the, the ticket would be engaged enough in their community and in their state to have voted in two out of the last, you know, you could, you could maybe make it uh, two out of the last four or something. But, you know, to not show any engagement by having voted is to me a problem. And if we have no residency definition, this is a proxy for engagement. 
Senator Polina, you haven't weighed in. Well, I think we're sort of meshing these two things together, residency requirement versus the need to vote in order to be allowed to run for office. I think that we don't in the United States of America we, and in Vermont, we don't require people to vote. Maybe that's something we should do down the road because there are certain countries where people are required to vote. But I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we don't do that here. I don't think it makes any sense to tell, tell somebody they have to have voted in the past in order to run for office. If I'm at a, I've, I'm 25 years old and I've never voted before, but I'm at a select board meeting or a town board, school board meeting or a legislative town hall, and I get inspired to run for office next year, I should be allowed to run for office next year because I'm inspired by what I experienced. It's too bad I didn't vote in the past, but if I get inspired one day to run for office, I shouldn't be, I should be able to do that without having a past requirement to have voted in previous elections. Well, they have a different requirement at the local level for what is what you need to prove for your residency. But many of us who are young have gone through residency challenges, you know, and we have had to um, at least weigh in and say how long we've lived in a certain community, you know, so it might as well be standardized for us so that we're not people, we're not just feeling under the threat of, well, I moved from one part of Burlington to another, you know, as a student. Um, I think it makes it clear for you, hey, this is what you need to be able to run. The, those of us who are young in politics have had people question our residency. So, you know, I'd rather have a clear definition. Well, I, I, will, I can tell you right now that I won't support this because I think that what you're saying is anybody who runs for a state, any office, or you has to have voted in whatever residency it is that they're, so four years they would have to have voted in every state and general election for that's, four years. That's to run and for statewide office. To run for statewide, to run for the Senate or the House, you would have to have voted in. And I think if you're gonna do that, they should have been required to vote in their local elections also not just in the statewide elections, in their local elections, because those local elections are very important. I, so I, other people can weigh in here, but I am not going to support this. I'm a vote against it. So Will, I see you had a... Yeah, Will was... Really quick, yeah. really quick just, but I want to make, I want to correct the record and make sure everybody's clear. There's, there is a residency definition in the elections laws. Uh, Title 17 has one. It defines what residency means for the purpose of voter registration. Right. The question, the question here is there's a lot of different residency definitions yeah. across the state statutes, and it's not clear which one should be applied to the residency language in the Constitution. Yes. Back when we were talking about graph, <laughs> I, people suggested that of any of those, right, since you're kind of in the election realm, looking at the one in Title 17 might make the most sense, but that's certainly not clear. And that one allows you, right? It's um, off the top of my head, intent to maintain a primary dwelling place in the town and to return there if temporarily absent. So that mm -hmm. definition contemplates temporary absence and still having a maintenance of residency, but I'll leave it at that. I wanted yeah. to be clear on the record. Yeah, that, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't have said there was no definition, but there, yeah. So committee members, I if we want to continue have get more testimony on this issue, I'm willing to do that. Uh, I personally think there are other issues that we need to address, but um, I'll leave it to the committee members if you want to take more testimony on this. Uh, Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I kind of enjoy this role. Um, I'm not on the fence too often. I, I'm either in or out, and it's pretty clear to me, but I'm on the fence. So I think uh, with all due respect to, uh, to your position, which I also understand, I would like to take more testimony, at least okay. understand this a little bit better before I make a decision. Thank you. Okay. All right. We will take more. I don't know who we will get to testify, <laughs> but we will take more testimony. Um, Senator Clarkson? You know, if it hadn't been an issue in, in a couple of elections and it, with a couple candidates in the last six years, I'd feel differently, but it's, a, it's an issue. 
And, um, and it, it, you know, I think it's one we, we should discuss further. I'm not sure it's one we'll maybe have enough time to actually, given the big, the scale of some of the other ones, but I, I think it's bubbled to the surface enough for us to discuss it further. Okay, I think that we will really need to define this clearly then about which elections they have to have um, voted in and how many. Anyway, okay. We'll Senator White, can I make list. one more quick yeah. comment on that? I'm yeah. really sorry. I think if you're thinking about other people to bring in, I would consider bringing in somebody maybe from the attorney general's office or a ledge council to talk yeah. about the constitutionality of such a requirement. Um, and then I just wanted to say to, to what Senator Clarkson was just saying, it, it has been an issue. And I will add to that, that we get a lot of questions in our office about, you know, with people thinking about running, what do those residency requirements mean? I don't think the answer to that necessarily is a requirement that you voted, although that could be considered. But I do think bringing clarity to what residency means in that context would be useful. Boy, I, we, we, could, we could try that again. I do have to tell you that um, I think Senator Polina and Senator Clarkson were both on the, and I don't know if you were there, Senator Colmore or not, but we had hours and hours of testimony, hours. And some people said, you have to be here every single day of the year, you can't leave. Some people said 181 days. Some people said um, two years out of four. So it is a, an issue, but um, I don't think we're gonna solve it. But anyway, okay. So are there some of these, um, I'm looking at the clock. Are there some of these administrative changes that are relatively, um, easy to address. And this I'll ask um, committee members and Carol and Will that, that are maybe easy to address and would be, would be helpful to you, but aren't big philosophical issues like the nickname on a ballot. Is that a relatively simple one? Carol. I think that one is relatively simple. Um, I think the ballot drop boxes is relatively simple. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope that the creating some kind of opportunity for um, early processing of ballots, whether it's 30 days, whether it's a week, whether it's two weeks, whatever, I think that that's something that sounded like there was universal support behind. Mm -hmm. um, How about the clarification of defective ballots? I, I think that, that that definitely needs to be figured out um, along with uh, the conversation around curing. Um, I think that we all want to find an opportunity to do that. When we get down into the discussion about how that happens, um, there will obviously be differences of opinion. Clerks are concerned mm -hmm. that we're going to be asked to somehow reach out to people and mm -hmm. figure out how to do that. Senator Rahm? Um, just while we're talking about mail-in balloting, I, I did notice that Audrey Klein from uh, National Vote at Home is here, and I didn't know oh. if she had wanted to say something. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. Um, okay, I do see. Um, I knew that there was, that you had submitted something, but did you want to um, have, say a few words? I'm sorry. Hello. Hello, ma'am. No problem. I can actually do you one better. Um, my CEO is actually on the line and she can speak to uh, just a couple things that didn't really come up on the list already. And we'll limit our testimony to those pieces if it's OK. Um, yeah. But we also want to sort of stand behind the secretary and the clerks and everything that's been said today. So I'm going to kick it over to Amber McReynolds, if that's all right. OK, thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Audrey. And thank you to everyone for uh, giving us a minute today to speak. Um, 
but we're again, wanna congratulate Vermont, Secretary Condos, the legislature for taking initiative last year in 2020 during a very difficult year to make this process even better. And I wanna commend you for being, I think the top, uh, the seventh highest increase in turnout of all states in the country, um, significant. Uh, many states that did mail a ballot are in that top echelon for states that saw big increases and in not being a swing state is, is truly a, a, a remarkable um, uh, um, thing to celebrate. So we're very, very pleased with that. Uh, our organization is a nonpartisan nonprofit um, and we focus on helping states improve vote by mail access and systems. And so that's our technical expertise. Uh, I ran elections for 13 years in Denver, Colorado and helped write the legislation that we ultimately passed eight years ago. Um, so we know what works. We're happy to be a resource for all of you. Uh, two things that you know we mentioned in our testimony that we submitted that did not get talked about much today uh, includes ballot tracking. Um, that's a, an issue and a technology platform that we've been working on for many years. Uh, it's actually been a system that Denver, Colorado has used for now 11 years. Uh, it's just like tracking a package through uh, when you order something online, but for your mail ballot. And it automates the notification of issues. So if the ballot is undeliverable or a signature or an affidavit isn't completed properly, it can automate all of those notifications so that a voter can get a text or an email right away when there's any issue. And it provides that extra accountability and transparency and security for where the mail ballot is in the process. So I think that's a really good uh, item to consider in terms of a technical enhancement for Vermont going forward. Um, and then of course, national change of address data and sort of automating address updates broadly is always something that we wanna encourage states to do. Um, and then finally, risk limiting audits. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of states enhanced their ability to audit this year. We think that's a key component of uh, a good election system that provides that transparency and that confirmation that everything operated the way it should. And mail ballots being paper ballots are a big component as to why risk limiting audits have been so successful in states like Colorado and elsewhere that have adopted them. Um, so encouraging Vermont to continue to move forward on on initiatives that expand uh, those uh, opportunities is, is also something that we wanted to share and encourage today. Um, and again, I just commend you all for, for your um, willingness last year to empower Secretary Condos to do uh, what needed to be done during a pandemic. And you should all be very proud of, of where you've put Vermont um, in, in terms of states that, that provided access and then also obviously increased turnout in a very big way. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, thank you. And um, do I understand that we have a local resident who's working with you who could actually represent you also at some of our meetings? Yeah, so certainly uh, Audrey's our national policy director and then we do have a couple of folks in Vermont that are definitely champions for, for Vote at Home and can be certainly available as a resource. So okay. feel free to use all of us uh, in, that, in that way, whatever is, is convenient and good for you. Good. I need to cut in. This is Audrey. I, I think, Senator, you might have been mentioning uh, uh, Peter Sterling, who yep. is, our, is our lobbyist there. Um, he sends his regards and he's been doing a great job. Um, we're just loving Vermont. We just want to get him in here on the hot seat. Happy to do it anytime. Okay, great. Those were good suggestions also. I, they will be put onto the, onto the list also. So just going back, can I ask if um, multiple return options isn't easy? Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we go back to your first list? I was scribbling as fast as I could. Um, nicknames. Okay, let's see, I think, you mean the, the kind of ones that might be, uh, that Carol mentioned that might be good, like uh, nicknames? Yeah, so let's talk about that, if we could. I assume well, what you mean is, They'll, well, I just want to understand okay. that somebody would not be able to use a nickname. Is that correct? Well, no, we just need to clarify what they can and can't do. Oh, okay. All right. I think I'm that's, fine. that's the question. Can you okay, use them? Can't you? Yeah. Okay. But Thank just, you. so we haven't made a decision about them, but I think that Carol's comment was that it probably wouldn't be that complicated to, to decide what the policy is okay. on nicknames. 
and on early processing. Ballot boxes. And drop boxes. And I wondered about multiple return options for, because you're gonna have ballots that get mailed out, whether we do an automatic mail out to everybody or not, you're going to have, you're going to have ballots that can mail back in because people request them. Absolutely. So should, yeah, sure. Right, so is multiple return options an easy one to tackle? Okay, yep, I think so. Carol, do you agree? Will? Yeah, what would be nice would be to have some clarification about a ballot that's mailed out and then brought back in person where, by a voter who wants to feed it into the tabulator themselves. Okay. Just having some clarification about process. Okay. We'll put that in there. And is the inner, uh, Will? I think, I think that's an easy one too. I was just gonna note that in my mind, the statute currently allows for multiple return options and is pretty um, flexible in that regard, but that implementing and, and putting more clarity around secure drop boxes is, is where that was headed. I yep. think that was language in the VPIRG list. I don't know if- It came from has... many places. Okay. Um, I, did, I purposely did not assign um, the comments to anybody because um, I wanted them to, I, I felt it was important to not assign them because then they took on a, mm -hmm. um, almost a position, if that makes sense. Yeah. So is the inner envelope, is that a relatively easy one or not? I know a lot of states don't use the inner certificate envelope. Secretary Condos has his hand up. Oh, I, okay, thanks. <laughs> I would say it's easy. Remove it from the list. I mean, we, we do not support, we think it's a terrible idea to remove the inner envelope. Uh, I, I know that it's, it's problematic, but it's really our only link to make okay. sure that we get an identity. Okay, well, we, I, I, it isn't that I didn't mean easy, just take it off the list, because some people have suggested that it is a, a solution. So I wanted to know what things are easy that might be non-controversial and relatively easy to, to get settled. Is there anything else on this list that is... Um, would be easily non-controversial and easily settled so that we can, as much as possible, what I want to do is, is go through these and not have constant conversation about them over and over and over again. But either we're going to get rid of them because nobody agrees, or we're going to um, say they're easily fixed. We're, we can come to some easy, um, decisions on them like the nickname and then we don't have to keep talking about them we can get them off the list and we can go on to the things that are more controversial that's that's what i mean by easy so is there anything else on here that seems to be of that nature that is just yes senator con um secretary condos so just so the committee understands we've already uh, engage with the Center for Civic Design to look at our certificate envelope, uh, the inner envelope that the ballot goes in, to ask to ask them to help us design that better and make it more clear, more concise. Okay. Uh, and so people understand. We would not support. Uh, when I said it was easy, it was easy to remove it because no, we no, would not support. We would not support getting rid of it. Secretary Condos. We don't want the arguments now for or against. All we want now is a list of things that we think are relatively non-controversial that we can decide on and then take them off the list. That one clearly has some difference of opinions and we'll, we'll address it when we put it on the agenda. Does, am I? You got it making any sense here? Yep. Okay. So is there anything else on that list that is non-controversial that we could just put on for
for our very first discussion and just decide on them and then they're done with that conversation and move on to the next level. Is there anything else on, on here that strikes anyone as very simple? How many, how many items did you read off, Madam Chair? I read off multiple return options, use of Dropbox, early processing, nickname, and um, then defective ballots. And it was paired with cur curing, but I'm not sure that it has to be. We need clarification on what is a defective ballot and whether it goes along with curing or not, I don't know, but that's what I read off. Okay, yep. <coughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I will send out um, this kind of list that I made. If, if, if people think I'm going down the wrong track here, let me know. But I, I think, is Senator Clarkson? Yeah, I also think there are things on your list we could just take off the list. And that way we don't even need to discuss them at all. Well, what are, I asked for those and nobody oh, suggested I, I, I'm any. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, well, I mean, there are ones that I'm not sure I understand. I mean, presidential nominating process. What, is, what does that mean? I mean, we don't. Well, somebody, I mean, we somebody, to, sub, somebody submitted it. So we might so be able, I would we suggest. Might take, okay. Uh, I might, didn't hear anybody bring it up. And, and uh, of, of all the people we've had here today, it strikes me we could take that off. We could. Well, it was uh, on the Secretary of State's list. Oh, it was? He didn't yes. mention it. No, he didn't, but they had a long list that okay. included a lot more detail than Okay. I don't I, I, I would need to know what they were wanting to discuss about it. I mean, I, I think that right. sadly it has I mean there are issues with it, there's no question, but and then um re, who put review the major party requirements on the list? The Secretary that of State has, did. I think oh, that, that is an issue. We're not mentioned. Okay. Great, then we can discuss them. I just had heard nobody else bring them up and I thought maybe we could take those off altogether, but I guess not if the Secretary of State put them on that list. Well, I think that, yes, uh, Senator Rahm and, and Secretary Condos. Um, well, this is an un unrelated topic, so I let Secretary Condos jump in. Okay. This topic. So, some of the stuff, uh, Senator White, that was on that initial list that we had presented to you a while ago, um, were things that were brought to us, for, just like you've had people bring to you. Some of this was stuff that was brought to us. Uh, when I saw your list about the presidential nominating process, I too questioned what what does that mean? Because I have no you, idea. You brought it to us. Well, we were. <laughs> I wouldn't say we were talking about the nominating process. We were talking about the the. Um, the, you know, we were hearing from people that were concerned that we had 21 candidates for, for president on the list this year. That was I, largely because of the number of, of uh, I mean, the, the waving of signatures this year. But the, the other question is, do we make any changes to, for instance, right now, it's a I think it's a thousand signatures. And there was some talk about making it 2000 signatures, some talk about making that it certain if I can, counties if i can say that's why i put it on the list because there were questions about it and i i didn't put all the details on there maybe i should have but somebody brought up the presidential nominating process and so i put it on the list then so clearly i guess that isn't one we can just get rid of because there are issues around it am i right or not there was just some questions that we were we wanted to raise with the committee. Well, uh, that's it, why it's there. I know uh, when when I spoke earlier today, I spoke with about the I highlighted just specific items that yes. I think almost everybody agrees with uh, as a, as a real focus to go forward. We could take your list and go from the top and work our way down one by one and have a discussion about each one, a brief discussion, take it off or leave it on. Uh, that's that's what I'm trying that's know, what I'm trying to do right now is if there are issues here that 
we took off we took off the 16 year old vote because that's a constitutional issue right so we took it off the list we talked about taking off the um, requirement to vote we decided not to take that off the list. We decided not to take off campaign contributions or the public financing study. We took off the faithless electoral issue because nobody, because there isn't an issue there. Now what we're trying to do is look at the issues that may be, <laughs> if we ever get to them, that may be non-controversial that we can just address and get rid of. I mean, either accept them or get rid of them. I don't mean get rid of them in, as in not doing anything about them, but have the brief discussion and come to some resolution. Can people use nicknames or not? It seems pretty simple. We can just do that and then we don't ever have to talk to it about it again. That, it, am I completely um, speaking out of my ear? Not completely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator. <laughs> you no, know, I think we're, we're we're grappling with it. It's always difficult to have a list like this and try to grapple your way through it. I think you know we're doing a good enough job. I really do. I think it's it's hard what we're trying to do. And I think so. I'm going to send out. I'm going to send it out again in a different format. So, Senator Rom. Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, to that question, Madam Chair. I would just say I am new to the Senate, but in my eight years in the House, it was almost a curse to call something so simple that it didn't need any testimony or consideration. So that might be why you hear some hesitancy on, on my part in any way to bless something as, as simple. So, you know, I love simple issues, but they never are simple in the end. So, you know, I, I think all of these merit discussion, but I'm also new, so I don't know what's already taken all of your time up. And in that vein, I have a question and I really am asking out of ignorance to how this process has unfolded in the past, but have you, do you usually take up local questions of non-citizen voting as charter changes completely unrelated to an elections bill or would we- No, I, that's, I, a, okay. that's a charter change. Okay. Because I think it, it has related questions to the residency question because Many of them have had different ideas of what you would do to have to prove that you are not a citizen, but a resident of that community. So I just- Well, we can, we can address some of those when we talk about that issue, but we, we would never take up that issue, that particular issue for any town without a charter before us. Right, right. Yeah. So I just wanted to flag it as a, as a there are pieces of that where they have, I think, different residency. Right components that they've put in that we should explore with the residency question. Um, all right, so I will tell you right now that at our next meeting, I will have um, a list for us, uh, yet another list, and you can throw away all the other lists, but we will be taking up the issues of multiple return options, use of drop boxes, early processing, nicknames, presidential nominating process, and the clarification of defective ballots. And maybe more, but does that make any sense to anybody? Yes. 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 Okay. And there might be more on the list. So anybody who wants to testify on those particular issues, and anything else we put on the list for next week, then um, be prepared to address those issues, not and and any other issues that end up on the legit on the thing, not the issue of uh, should we have one checklist uh, statewide. Oh, the other one I think we that might be relatively simple is consistent polling hours across the state. That was on somebody's list. Sure. Yeah. So we'll take that up at the same time. Yes. And I'm not implying that they're simple questions. I'm just implying that they're they aren't um, major philosophical changes as mail out ballots and what goes around along with them is. Okay. Committee, thank you. And thank you for indulging me with these um, all these lists and, 
and um, things. But Keisha, I will tell you that um, one of the ways that this committee passed um, <clears throat> what I thought was a relatively um, elegant bill a number of years ago was the medical marijuana dispensaries. And the way we did it is we took the lists from everybody. And in that case, it was law enforcement and the advocates. And we took those two lists and we put them together and we started going through the issues one by one by one by one. And we came up with a really good bill because we addressed the issues and they didn't always agree, but, but we came up with an answer to each of the issues. Mm. And, and so I just want to, you know, so far say, I really love this. I think you've put out, you know, far and wide casting a net for elections issues. Um, I just didn't want my, my face or my silence to say like, I either agree or, or disagree oh. on something. I just, you know, whenever someone said something simple, I, I didn't know what that meant in this committee's context, which is. is oh yeah. Really it's, and it doesn't necessarily mean you agree. Yes. <laughs> it just means that maybe, maybe there's a solution, an easy solution. Right. It just means they're ones we can check off sooner rather than later. Exactly, exactly. And then when we check them off, we never go back to them. Exactly. And my oh, a actually, we've checked off a couple of the things on this list and have already actually passed them out of the Senate. Hmm. <laughs> we have. And we're returning to them, I might yes. point out. <laughs> well, I, I because I think Senator Collimore asked us to return to the uh, campaign contributions, and they will just look at what the public financing study is and what it means, what we passed before. Sure. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your input. It was really, and I hope you join us as we go forward here, and I will make sure that these other three suggestions, um, four actually, because the vote at home also, and campaign for Vermont and um, the Republican and Democratic parties. I'll make sure that those um, ideas get incorporated into the list. And, and I realize that um, some may be more weighty and have more support than others, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, the ones that aren't acknowledged as an issue by a large number of people aren't important. So, so, okay, thank you so much. Now we get to deal with retirement issues. Could, Ma Madam yes. Chair, we have been sitting for, am I, no, we consider we are, what we promised ourselves to, yes. to do? We are going to take a five minute break so that we can run up and down the stairway and get a drink of water. And 25 jumping jacks.